You think Einstein walked around thinking everyone was a bunch of dumb shits? This is a business conversation. Is that what you call it? it sounds to me like you're still being hoorahed by a little girl. You say hoorahed? How can you give up now after the many months you've dedicated to finding Cheney? I misjudged you. I picked the wrong man. I would go on in your company if there were a clear way to go. I think if you asked, if you took a straw poll of actors um, all over the world and gave them three directors that they'd love to work with, I think Joel and Ethan would probably be on everybody's list. And, and, uh, um, and I'd met them and seen them over the years, and I had a lot of friends who worked with them, and, and, uh, and I'd obviously seen all of their films and, and uh, followed them very, very closely, but I just never had a chance. There was just never a role that was right for me. Uh, and so I was, I was thrilled to get a phone call from, from, from those guys. No doubt Cheney fancied himself scot-free, but he was wrong. You must pay for everything in this world one way and another. There is nothing free except the grace of God. Yeah, well, they, they said on this one their default setting was classical. Right. You know, they, they really, uh, they loved the book, and they really wanted to honor the book, in the, you know, with the film, and, and, uh, which I thought was a great way to go. I, I'm, really, I'm really proud of the movie. I, I wouldn't change a frame of this movie, and I, and I have only felt that way about one other movie that I did. Which was? Uh, the Informant. Oh. <laughs> But those guys are unbelievably prepared, like they storyboard everything. And now they're at the stage where, despite having everything meticulously storyboarded, they don't really adhere to the storyboards anymore because they're so experienced. They can kind of, you know, if a better idea comes to them on the spot, they just kind of drive in that direction. And they, they're just, it was really, they're really efficient and just amazing. Do you even remember the first movie? No, you know, I never saw the, the first true movie. I'm probably the one guy in America that missed the first movie. And when they called me about this one, uh, I went out to get the movie and they said, actually, what you should really do is read the book. And, right. and that's, you know, that, what they were interested in doing was a, was a very faithful adaptation of the Charles Portis novel. And, right. And the novel was real. I mean, it's just a phenomenal novel. And, and I'm surprised that I missed it. And I, they should be, this should be in American classrooms. It's a really wonderful American novel. And Cleet Wharton, half brother. Oh, Cleet was selling ardent spirits to the Cherokee. Come at me with a king bolt. He advanced upon you with nothing more than a king bolt. I've seen men bat a torp with nothing bigger than a king bolt. I defended myself. They, they, they tried to use as much of what Charles Portis wrote as they as they could mm -hmm. uh, in the adaptation, and uh, and boy, he just had such a, an incredible ear for dialogue. It's just really beautiful writing. That as well. His depredations have come to an end. Your friend Rooster does not collect many prisoners. He is not my friend. He's abandoned me to a congress of louts. You did not varnish your opinion. That yeah, was great. I mean, and also doing a Western with them and with Jeff, you know, and Haley was like 13 and she was so sweet. That was another situation where Jeff and I kind of as parents were like very, everyone was, I mean, to be fair, I mean, the, the, you know, everyone there was wanted to make sure that she had a good time, and I think she really did, and she's amazing in the movie, too. She was another one of those, it's like, obscenely gifted, you know, child actor. Why'd you come here to tell me this? Oh, I thought we might shop around up here next year, but I guess we're doing all right in Little Rock. I'm Maddie Ross. Haley's actually younger than the character that she plays, and it's, it's a really incredible, performance. It's amazing to me that a 13-year-old did what she does in the, in the film. It's a, just, a, just a really great performance, which is a kind of a testament to her and also to Ethan and Joel and, and the way that they directed her. They tell me you're a man with true grit. I'm looking for the man who shot and killed my father, Frank Ross, in front of the Monarch boarding house. The man's name is Tom Cheney. They say he's over in Indian Territory, and I need somebody to go after him. What's your name, girl? My name is Maddie Ross. I'm still baffled by what she did in the movie. And, and to Joel and Ethan's credit, they, they directed her. Um, I was a little shocked when I first saw it because she was just 13. And, and, uh, but they didn't infantilize her at all. Like, they would go give her direction the same way they'd talk to me or to Jeff or to Josh or Barry. Um, 
and she would make these adjustments. And I remember doing my first big scene with her. Um, you know, it was like a three page scene and, and we're both in this room and they gave her this direction. It was, you know, fairly tricky. And she adjusted the performance and, and we did the scene again and it was, she'd made the adjustment. And then they came up and gave her another piece of direction and she took that uh, and, and, and made another adjustment. I, re I remember looking at Roger Deakins, the cinematographer who I've known for years. And I said, like, Roger, has this been going on like the whole time? Like, what? And he went, yeah, I mean, she's really that good. Yeah. And uh, and I don't know what that is. I, I I know that I couldn't have done that when I was 13. I know I couldn't have done it when I was 23, probably. You know, so it's just, she's special. You know, she's a special kid. I don't believe in fairy tales or sermons or stories about money, baby sister, but thanks for the cigarette. You go for a man hard enough and fast enough, you don't have time to think about how many is with him. He thinks about himself. What is your intention, Rooster? You think one on four is a dog fall? Feel your hand, you son of a bitch! <laughs> Jeff was inspired casting, I thought. Um, Jeff is just, this was a perfect role for him because it's, it's you know, it's, it's a really fun role. It's, a, it's a, you know, the, what, what, the Cogburn character, uh, you know, he's, he, he drinks too much, he's, he's, he's inappropriate, he's, uh, he bends the rules. He's kind of a classic American, uh, you know, uh, protagonist in a way, uh, uh, imperfectly perfect. And, uh, and Jeff brings, you know, all of that stuff. And he's incredibly funny and incredibly dynamic as an actor. And, and, uh, and just working with him, he brings this kind of joy to his work that it just is uh, really infectious and, um, and, and really fun to be around. Put your switch away, the beef. I ain't to finish with her start. It would be the biggest mistake you ever made, you Texas brush popper. I mean, he's, you know, under it all. He's one of the great American actors. I mean, he really is. And and uh, and so the the amount of technique and I mean, he's just he's just a monster. I mean, he really uh, it's a strange thing when you're acting with somebody who uh, who's that good. Um, you almost don't have to do anything. You just he's good enough for both of you, you know, and just, I've had those, you know, scenes with, whether it's, you know, Morgan Freeman or Tom Hanks or Denzel, or these guys, you know, they just, they're just, just show up. I got it. You know, it's like, it's like playing on, you know, Babe Ruth's baseball team. It's like, you don't really have to do that much. Your name is Maddie. Isn't that something? Yes, and I know you, Tom Cheney. Josh just did this thing with his, with his whole bearing and with his voice. Uh, uh, the first time he opens his mouth, you go, "Oh my God, I get it. I get, I get what this guy's thing is." Let me ride up with you. <laughs> I will pay you fifty dollars out of my winnings. I am not heavy. I'm sure you can ride for days. I've seen no groundwater. I have lapped filthy water from a hoof print. I was glad to have it. Are you some kind of law? That's right. I'm a Texas Ranger. I kind of come into this as this guy who's very proud to be a Texas Ranger, but uh, Rooster doesn't really see much value in my, uh, in, uh, you know, kind of the experience that I have, and I'm trying to kind of impress him, but at the same time a little irked that he doesn't really appreciate how, <clears throat> what it means to be a Ranger. And, uh, and so it's just kind of one of those fun, uh, fun, you know, relationships, because I think, the, you know, the audience kind of feels like I'm a windbag too, so it's kind of fun to see, uh, you know, Rooster kind of get the best of me. I don't mind a little personal chaffing, but I won't hear anything against a ranger troop from a man like you. How long you boys been mounted on sheep down there? Captain Quantrill, <laughs> indeed. Let's let this go to beef. Congratulations, Cockburn. You've graduated from marauder to wet nurse. Adios. It was a great, it's a great character and uh, uh, really fun to play. He's, uh, he's, he's full of himself and uh, kind of a windbag and just doesn't stop talking. And we, we talked about, you know, I did a movie 
in 94 that Tommy Lee Jones directed. And uh, Tommy Lee is somebody who, uh, not only, I mean, I great admirer of his mm -hmm. body of work, but, uh, but he's somebody who on the set, he's just fun to listen to. He knows right. a lot about a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Joel and Ethan had worked with him on No Country for Old Men. Oh, okay. All right. Performance of his in that one. And, and, uh, and so we had him in, as a common frame of reference. He's from West Texas. Right. That's from West Texas. Okay. And I said, well, what if the guy was similar to, you know, Tommy Lee, but, but unlike Tommy Lee, didn't have anything really worth <laughs> saying. So he's got, he's all style and no substance. Make me out foolish in this girl's eyes. I think she is. You pretty well figured. Bullet of pass through. Uh, what happened to your mouth? Uh, I, I believe I bit myself. You are more handicapped without the eye than I without the arm. The Texas Ranger presses on alone. On the technical side, I was like trying to figure out the tongue thing when he gets his tongue uh, injured. And that we figured out. I was sitting in a makeup trailer one day on another movie and picked up a hair tie and just put it around my twist, started twisting it around my tongue and just tried to speak normally. And that was how we kind of came up with that little gag. Dramatic scene where you actually have to spank the poor girl. She said that she wore a lot of uh, padded uh, underwear, you know, to ensure this wasn't a painful event when you ripped her down and went through this. Yeah, I, I you know, and I made sure too. I mean, I, we practiced it and I, I asked her, you know, I, you, know, you know, promise me this, this doesn't hurt. And she said, I actually can't feel it. So that, that, that was good. That kind of been in front of them cheap shells on me again. I thought you were going to say the sun was in your eyes. That is to say, your eye. Every scene that, uh, that I did was fun for a different reason. The corn dodger scene is really, <laughs> I had a really good time. I mean, there was like about the sixth take on that line about the eye. I just went, you know, I, th I thought you were going to say the sun was in your eyes. That is to say, your eye and and just did that and like they, I heard Joel and Ethan start laughing and they cut and I started laughing and dearest mother I'm about to embark on a great adventure I have learned that Tom Cheney has fled into the wild and I shall assist the authorities in pursuit you know that Papa would want me to be firm in the right as he always was so do not fear on my account Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. The author of all things watches over me, and I have a fine horse. I think they all have true grit, you know. Uh, you know, at first, at first the idea is that uh, it's Rooster has true grit, and then she, uh, when, when, when we all kind of fall out, you know, at the end of the second act, she, she says to me that, you know, I picked the wrong man, and, you know, and, and she sees that I'm the one who has true grit, but in reality, it's the little girl that has the, you know, the true grit, the, you know, the one who kind of follows this all the way through, and uh, you know, at such a young age, and uh, um, so I think that's that's the idea behind it. Stand up, Tom Cheney. It's not just a simple revenge story. There's a, it's about growing up and getting older and time getting away and all the things that happen, uh, I, it really kind of, it, if I, found it, I found it oddly because, you know, when I'm in a movie, I, I tend to not be as moved necessarily by it, but I, I found myself really uh, moved by it. It's, it's an, got, got a lot of humanity, um, you know, as well has a lot of humor.